Well, greetings and welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. Happy to be here with you. I hope everyone uh, watching is happy, safe, healthy, and especially sane. We're living in a absolutely topsy-turvy, crazy world, and um, we're waiting to get out of it. And uh, one of the things that I'm going to be talking about tonight is why getting out of that craziness may be a little bit more problematic and difficult than we would like to think. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but uh, we're going to get right into it. Um, I just want to say one or one or two couple couple of things here. I'm I know it's been a while since I've done a, a new live YouTube show, but the truth is I've been much more active in the safe confines of my website at richardolandmembers.com. I'm not gone from YouTube by any means. In fact, I'm doing a live interview in two nights with uh, filmmaker James Fox on his new film called Phenomenon. And in fact, that's a really good documentary. I would suggest if you're interested in new upcoming information, cutting edge information on the UFO field, you will want to see the film and you will want to listen to the interview that James and I have. Um, he gives a great interview. We'll have a lot to say. Anyway, that's Thursday night, uh, eight o'clock Eastern. So do check that out if you've got the time. And I've got plans for a number of other new programs here on this channel uh, in the future. So you will want to stay sharp for those. They are coming. I consider this subject that we're talking about tonight to be very important. So I'm going to be jumping right in. I do just want to say that the theme that I'm talking about tonight, the basic idea, is something that I have been working on for a good portion of this year. Um, so, in fact, I have a link for uh, an earlier version of this lecture and a much more comprehensive version of what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight. I did a much more in-depth version of it in a, a link that is provided just below this box here. And it's uh, regarding a lecture called The Fourth Stage of Humanity. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you will soon enough because I'm going to be getting into it here tonight to... Um, a little bit more of a limited extent than I did in June for my online lecture, but you're going to get a pretty good idea about it. Um, so I didn't put the uh, reference to the COVID virus pandemic lockdown in the formal title of this video because, I mean, YouTube's just going to come all over me and demonetize, pull the video. They do this all the time when you talk about COVID in a way that they don't like. Um, and the fact is that I don't, I'm not really here to provide a definite opinion one way or the other on the pandemic versus plandemic thesis, or even to get into any of the real details, uh, biological, physiological of, of the COVID virus itself. Uh, we can come back to that. I, I don't mind talking about that. I have certain thoughts and opinions on that, but that is not what I'm here to talk about. Um, I'm going to start just by suggesting to you a little bit of, I don't know, is it irony? Not irony. The fact that this virus started in China, and I think we can all agree on that. And what's turning out to be the case is that the global response to this virus is turning the rest of the world into China. And that's a really bizarre thing to think about, but I think it's undeniable. The response to this pandemic is, I mean, even to call it draconian is, I think, beyond, that, that word doesn't really even describe it fully. And I think it's fair to say that if we were all just to rewind the clock less than a year ago to the, you know, to the new year of 2020, I think it's fair to say that no one could have predicted the level of craziness and totalitarian kookiness that we are now seeing not just in the United States, not just in Europe, everywhere, everywhere in the world, we're seeing draconian extreme responses to this pandemic. And again, I'm not even trying to take sides here. Uh, there, I, Look, this is a very politicized issue. So there are people who believe that the masks are complete nonsense, get rid of them, burn the masks. And then there are people who uh, believe very strongly in in the masks, and also are even more concerned about just the spread of the, the virus and doing everything we can do to, to 
damp it down. I, I get it. Like, I think most of, like most rational, normal people understand that there are really two sides of looking at this. You know, when you when you look go into the media, especially the very controlled establishment mainstream media, it's very easy to get the idea that it's like all one side or all the other side. And you have to be either full on straight libertarian, no masks, do what you want, or you have to be complete, you know, social distancing and uh, fearfulness for the virus. And you, there's no in between. And I, I just don't think that most normal people are that way. I think that most psychologically normal people understand that there actually are two ways of looking at this. And, and there are two valid ways to understand a person's response to this pandemic. Um, look, it's fair to say that when we were sold this bill of goods back in February, uh, we were sold a very different bill of goods. So a virus that we were told was basically 55, 50 times more deadly than it actually is. So that's very important to understand. And uh, the transmission levels, it, it's not clear to me if this is more or less transmissible than we were told back in February. This does seem to be a highly contagious virus, but in terms of mortality and morbidity, uh, I don't think there's any question, like it is vastly lower, vastly, vastly lower than what we were told back in February. And then the other thing I just want to point out before I jump right in, I've got a bunch of slides I'm going to share with you. Uh, but the other thing that I just wanted to share, and what the hell was it now? My mind's just going all over the place. It'll come back to me. Uh, <laughs> we, um, yeah, so less mortality, and I'm not even working off of notes here. You think I, I should actually, but uh, in any case, the bill of goods was not what we were told. Oh yeah, the other thing is flattening the curve. Remember flatten the curve? Remember that whole thing? So we were told back in March, stay at home, hunker down, stock up on your toilet paper and your food. Uh, in the early months, it was like, don't wear a mask. We were told like, don't wear a mask because it didn't make any difference, we were told. And everyone knew actually that, yeah, I think I'm gonna go to a mask. And we know why you're saying that because you don't want the hospitals to be without the masks and we all understand that. Um, but the point was we were supposed to flatten the curve. And so everyone's gonna do their bit two weeks, maybe a month, to prevent the hospitals from being overwhelmed. Well, has anyone been talking about flattening the curve in the last, what, four or five months? Like no one. The curve has been flattened. It's done, it's flattened. And the mortalities uh, for this, you know, infection rates are high, but mortality rates are really low. And so that's where we're at. So we were definitely sold a different bill of goods back in February and March. And look, if you want to be generous about it, you can just say people panicked, leaders panicked. If you want to go that route, you can you can go down different routes if you wish. But the fact is, we were we were not given accurate information with which to make a decision. And the result has been a complete shutdown and uh, we have to say collapse of much of the global economy. And uh, look that this economy is not coming back. It's not gonna come back for a long, long time. Uh, we've destroyed, uh, you know, here in the United States where I live, uh, retail, many, like all the mid-sized retailers, they're just, they're done. And what's really happening is that Amazon's gobbling up their market share. And maybe, maybe Walmart will gobble up their market share. And when you see these little mom and pops going down, left and right everywhere. This is a huge portion of the global economy, certainly a huge portion of the United States economy. And those folks are just going, to, going permanently, many of them to be out of business and they're not coming back. And when you really consider how important that part of the economy has been to generate wealth and to generate freedom for ordinary people so that they can survive on their own doing their thing. Uh, well, we've just seen the the Western and global economy take a massive body blow. Um, and the winners are obviously going to be the banksters at the, at the top of our pyramid and uh, the larger corporate entities that are able to buy up and take up the market share that's been now opened up. We're gonna get into a lot of the other things. So um, I'm gonna start sharing some screens here with you. One of the things that 
one of the key things that's happened here with, with the COVID response has been to accelerate something that has already been happening in our civilization, our global society for quite a while already. And that is hastening us toward, again, what I keep calling the fourth stage of humanity. I'm gonna get into that in a bit more detail in probably 20 minutes or so. So just stay with me. But at least in the immediate term, I'm gonna show you a couple of articles. These are all from the last month uh, to just point out something that everyone watching this probably already knows, which is how the pandemic response has normalized certain things that we would have considered absolutely shocking uh, you know, nine, 10 months ago. So normalizing surveillance, normalizing, um, you know, draconian policing, normalizing censorship, even more than last year, which was bad. Last year was a bad year for censorship. This year is vastly worse. Uh, and the COVID pandemic is, is really normalizing that. So here's, here's it. Oh, let me just uh, see if I can make this a little bit better, uh, larger for you. I'm not really that great at this. You got to forgive me. Here we go. So, so normalizing surveillance. It seems to me that uh, you know the craziness is going on pretty much everywhere, but Australia is taking the front row here right now. They're out in the front as far as uh, draconian craziness is concerned, and I've really wondered why that is. And um, I guess my best guess. And I, I love Australia. I love the Australian people. I've been there a number of times. I really like the country, but. What you have with Australia is a, a big country, but a big empty country. And it's, um, you know, geographically almost the size of the United States, but it's got less than a tenth of the population. So you've got, I think, something like less than 30 million people in Australia. And not only that, but they're not spread out very much. Like the whole center mass of the country is basically empty. And so you've got a couple of geographic regions where most of the people live. So it makes it easy to control and it makes it a good uh, test subject for new laws that can be then rolled out. Once you test them in Australia, you can see you can tweak them and fine tune them and then roll them out for the rest of the world. And I think that's what's happening here. Right now, the Melbourne area, Victoria, is where a lot of the COVID uh, response is taking place that when you look at it in the news, you just think, good grief. What the hell is happening there? So this is an article. This is the most recent one. This just came out, I think, today or yesterday. Um, mom is arrested at a beach for traveling outside her five-kilometer radius without a mask. So she got arrested, and she's, I think, being fined. I don't think she's going to see prison for this, but you can just see what's happening here. Um, the whole five-kilometer thing, it, it's not clear to me exactly how they determined that, but... Uh, as I'm going to show you uh, a little later, there's a, a program called Geofence, which is basically the whole thing is designed to track you by your cell phone, a GPS you. And this is really not that difficult uh, with increasing levels of AI uh, working their way into policing and government uh, surveillance applications. Uh, I think anyone can see that this is a really super easy thing to implement. Uh, the only restrictions are legal. And in Australia, they're using the COVID pandemic as a very, very good uh, excuse, uh, pretext, I should say, to try this out in one province of one country on the opposite, of, opposite side of the world for many of us and you know, just see how it goes. So that's the craziness there, but it doesn't stop there. So you've now got, uh, let me move this, this one, this, this, um, Story is really upsetting to a lot of people. This happened, I think, about a month ago. Another Australian uh, woman, I think she's in her 20s, she was starting a Facebook protest, or she was organizing a protest on Facebook, I should say, to uh, protest against the masks and the, you know, the social distancing and all of that stuff. So she goes on Facebook, starts to organize it, and this is a photograph that she's pregnant. You can I don't know if you can tell here, and she is taken out of her home and arrested. I mean, it it really scared the hell out of her, traumatized her, um, and so they did that. Now, you know, again, everyone can have their own opinion on whether she was right or wrong to protest against social distancing. People have strong opinions on this. Um, 
I get it. We all can get that. But the fact is when you have police going into someone's home to arrest them because of a post they made on Facebook to plan a protest over this, you really have to ask yourself, uh, <laughs> you know, what, what in God's name is happening here? Here's another uh, piece of news out of the Melbourne area, Victoria. I think this is Victoria. It's in Australia. I think it's, I think it's Victoria. Uh, this is from last August. I'm not sure how far they went with implementing this. I, I suspect that they have gone. I, I suspect they use it to arrest the woman with her five kilometer violation there. This is uh, announcing the use of drones in the Australian skies to detect and crack down on COVID rule breakers. And this is really, this is an official tweet here from a news agency in uh, yeah Melbourne, you see it right, see it right on the top there. High powered drones will be used to find people not wearing masks and cars too far from home. So yeah, that you can see is August 12th of this year. Um, and here's one more Australian. There's actually quite a few of these Australian news pieces that are coming out. It's absolutely just uh, phenomenal to me. We're not seeing this level of craziness in most of the United States. Uh, some areas of the U.S., yes. Um, but, I mean, overall, it, it's restricted to certain areas. Uh, but the U.S. Is, is much more federal, and there's much more leeway among various states so you see a lot of variation here in Australia. You're seeing this. This is uh, Daniel Andrews, who's the uh, premier of Victoria, has had made a proposal that would allow government officials to arbitrarily arrest citizens for uh, various COVID violations. And again, this is I think this is an RT article. Um, you know, you got to get your news where you can get it. And um, unfortunately, in the in the West, most U.S. mainstream and Western mainstream news is uh, less than useless. It's not all happening in Australia. Obviously, we realize this. This is a UK uh, piece here. There's UK Minister of Police, whose name is, uh, let me just get in there. Oh yeah, Kit Malbauer, or I think that I'm trying to look at that name. It's kind of tiny there. Has, uh, <laughs> he's got a lot of pushback for this, encouraging uh, residents, subjects in the UK to spy on their neighbors, to look for COVID contraventions. Uh, this was described very, I think, apropos as an East German Stasi kind of technique. And um, it's funny, you know, I actually spent one summer many, many years ago in the 1980s in East Germany. Uh, maybe I'll come back and talk about that sometime. But I will tell you back then, uh, the East German police were definitely to be feared and uh, East German security was definitely something that you had to be very careful about. But actually where we're at now, 35 years later, I was there in 1986, uh, where pff, we have absolutely equaled, if not surpassed, what they were doing in that society back then, in my view. Uh, this is a piece on geofence. And um, now, geofence is something that's actually been, was initiated more than a couple of years ago, I think maybe two years ago or so. And we don't need to get into the whole thing here in detail, but it essentially it's a, a technique by which policing, uh, police in the United States want to use uh, your cell phone data to track you so that if you were near the scene of a crime, here I can unshare this, that they would know you were there and they could... Um, you know, get you as a witness, or in the case of the article that I was showing there, they wrongfully arrested a man because someone else was using, borrowing his phone or a phone that was licensed to him uh, in the commission of a crime. They arrested the guy whose phone it was. The guy had nothing to do with the crime. It turned out he got exonerated, but it's not a foolproof system, obviously. But when you really think about the implications of this uh, being applied for COVID, it's not that difficult to see where this is going. Uh, these are fun little surveillance technologies that police and government uh, organizations have been drooling at the opportunity to use. You know, they, they can't help it in a sense. Like we as citizens don't want them to use it, but from their point of view, they're all about one thing, which is about doing their job 
as well as they think that they can do it. And from their point of view, that means total information, total spying, total surveillance of the population. While I'm on this, uh, using the word total all the time, I want to talk about totalitarianism. Uh, <clears throat> it occurred to me that I think a lot of the public and probably a lot of the media has a really incorrect view of what totalitarianism is. Uh, seems to me when people think of totalitarianism, they think of fascism or they may think of communism. They'll think of Hitler, they'll think of Stalin, they'll think of Mao. A lot of the mid 20th century dictators, particularly, they always come to mind, Mussolini, uh, maybe. Um, but totalitarianism doesn't have to be fascist, it doesn't have to be communist. It, all that it means, um, I mean, you could have totalitarianism and elections. You can have them both. Totalitarianism simply means total control, and total information, certainly, by a government over your activities, which therefore means total behavioral control is then feasible when they have total information because they have total information about everything that you do, you have no privacy. That's probably the number one criterion for having a totalitarian society is zero privacy. If you have no privacy, you have little to no ability really to act on your own in with any kind of security uh, and, and, and you know, thought of safety. So that's the first thing. But you can have a totalitarian society when with people who uh, have a growing economy, that's certainly possible. You can have a totalitarian society with elections, particularly if those are meaningless elections. Uh, people can vote for a totalitarian candidate. There's, there's no inherent reason why they can't, all right? It, totalitarianism is not the same thing as cult of personality. And I think this is the single most significant thing that a lot of people get wrong about totalitarianism or even fascism or, or communism. Um, the mid 20th century dictators like Hitler and Stalin and Mao, yeah, they had cultivated a very careful cult of personality. Uh, where they were like these demigods. And you still have it in North Korea, um, where the leader is considered uh, semi-divine. But in fact, that's really totally unnecessary to a totalitarian society. And in fact, it's, it's almost a distraction. Uh, I would suggest that those dictators had a cult of personality it, it, for one reason, which is that societies were a lot more religious in, in those years. And I will suspect that they believed it was a much more useful uh, tactic for them to take the place of the traditional religions that existed at the time, you know, um, mostly Christianity in this case. But you, you know, I think they perceive that uh, traditional religions were a competitor for the loyalty of the people. So you create, you create a new godlike figure in the dictator, and that's the cult of personality. Uh, sure. I think a lot of those guys were absolutely narcissistic and probably enjoyed being treated that way, but it's it's actually just a business for them, and their job is simply to control the population. I can't imagine that a dictator is really going to care uh, what some working stiff on the other side of the country thinks as long as that person obeys. They're all about getting obedience, and if it, if it means turning the dictator into a god, fine, but it's really not necessary, not at all. For total control, all you need to do is let people know that they're being completely monitored all the time and you enforce uh, obedience through fear in that way. And of course you propagandize them 24 seven, you control the news, uh, all of the things that we're now seeing. We're seeing all of this happen very, very rapidly in our society. I mean, just shockingly. Let me keep going here. So, so I was talking about total surveillance uh, and normalizing surveillance. Now we can normalize, we're normalizing censorship. We've been normalizing censorship for quite a few years now. Uh, many of you know about Dr. Li Meng Yan. She um, has gotten limited some uh, mainstream media attention for her uh, claims. And again, this is someone you can believe her or not believe her, but uh, she has been completely censored out of the public discussion. So this is her Twitter page right before Twitter pulled it and uh, banned her, her page. She'd gotten up to, in four days, um, I think it was four days that she'd been on Twitter, she got up to like 60,000 followers 
and she'd had only four posts when they yanked her uh, because she had posted a link to a, a, a scientific paper that she had co-authored with a number of other scientists. Uh, Dr. Yan is someone who was in China at the start of the pandemic in December of 2019. She's a qualified scientist. She's got all the right credentials. And uh, her situation was very simply, she has made some very strong arguments. She's said that the virus is artificial, that it's man-made and intentionally man-made and intentionally released. Um, she did an interview less than a month ago on Tucker Carlson over at Fox. I, I think, I don't know if that's on YouTube or not. It might be on YouTube. Uh, it was definitely um, banned on Twitter and Facebook made it very difficult to find. Not sure what the status of it is on YouTube. But I mean, because of it's Fox, it's harder for YouTube to go after the videos of a major corporation like Fox, like guaranteed if that had been a smaller uh, YouTube channel, I, I would suspect that, you know, you wouldn't be seeing it. The point is simply this, you can agree with her or not, but the fact that she has been pushed to the side so severely and, you know, with a very concerted media effort to delegitimize her as well. Um, you know, you can see that this is becoming normalized. This whole element of our society is something that with COVID, we're seeing it becoming much, much more, um, much more normalized. Here's another example of normalizing censorship. And again, I'm using examples of COVID. So I didn't know about this until I stumbled on this one, but uh, an article, uh, I think this is, I can't remember where this is from. You can Google this. Is it evidence that masks don't work being purged from the internet? Now, I happen to think that masks do work, uh, at least to some extent. You know, when the, when the pandemic started, I was uh, kind of ahead of most of the folks. I went on Amazon and I bought up a bunch of surgical masks. It was like, the hell with it. I didn't care what anyone else, anyone else was saying. I wanted some for myself because I didn't believe the mainstream media narrative that masks were not important. Um, I was like, I'm getting them. And I did. And now you're hearing alternate points of view, which uh, I guess what you could say is, you know, technically, let me just show you the rest of these articles, uh, rest of this article. So there's um, a website that had a number of articles dealing with, uh, you know, why, in their opinion, masks don't work in, you know, blocking the uh, COVID infection. And those articles were uh, pulled, and this absolutely is true. And the statement given here is, quote, if you are looking for why face masks don't work, a revealing review by John Hardy, um, it has been removed. The content was published in 2016 and is no longer relevant in our current climate. So they're not saying it's untrue. They're not saying anything other than the fact that it's no longer relevant. And they decided to just uh, prevent the spread, uh, I think, of information which may cause harm. So this is something we're seeing frequently more and more. Uh, the whole thing with masks, yeah, look, uh, when I'm in public in an indoor setting, I, of course, you have to wear a mask, so it's pretty much by law, but I'm, I'm fine with it, uh, you know, as, as long as it slows down the spread of, uh, of the disease, okay, fine. When I'm outdoors, not a believer in masks in the least, and I just think that's, uh, there's no evidence to me that wearing a mask outdoors really does anything whatsoever. Uh, if, if you keep a couple of feet away from someone else, that's my opinion. Uh, I want to point out uh, this article here. This is uh, Dr. Scott Atlas, who has become um, top level health advisor to Donald Trump. He had a video that was pulled on YouTube where he was doing an, uh, an interview with, I think it was the Hoover Institute, uh, on his philosophy of, you know, not wearing a mask and, uh, and, uh, and his argument essentially for reopening the economy. I think that was his main thing. Um, and talking about how, yes, kids can transmit the disease, but at a lower rate than adults. That video was pulled. 
um, when it achieved, I think like three quarters of a million views. It is now available on YouTube. Let me just show you here. Um, they put it back up and the video's gotten, I think like 35, 40,000 views, but with this note, and I, um, I'm going to read this. I think this is quite interesting. On September 11th, 2020, YouTube removed this episode of Uncommon Knowledge with Peter Robinson and Dr. Sky Atlas and notified the Hoover Institution that the video, quote, violates our guidelines. The takedown notice further explore, explained that YouTube does not allow content. Listen carefully to this does not allow content that spreads medical misinformation that contradicts the World Health Organization or local health authorities' medical information about COVID-19, including on methods to prevent, treat, or diagnose COVID-19 and means of transmission. In order to reinstate the program, the interview on their platform, YouTube required the Hoover Institution to add the following disclaimer to two portions of the interview. Quote, Prevailing medical consensus suggests that children can transmit the disease, but at a lower rate than adults, end quote. While we disagree with YouTube's interpretation of what Dr. Atlas said in this video, we have complied with this request to make the video available to viewers. It's just like you have to go along to get along. Again, YouTube's been, uh, you know, the ultimate finger wagon school marm nanny for a while now. They've been a lot of my videos God forbid I talk about any kind of, uh, you know, politically controversial topic whatsoever without them either demonetizing. Um, I haven't had any videos pulled off YouTube, so I'm, I'm glad about that. But uh, other people have. And, you know, I've just been, as it just that I'm cowed enough by them that I just don't want to test the, the sensor. And the answer is yes, I just, I don't really want to fight them on this. Uh, it's one reason I, I go to my website at Richard Ola Members where I, I'm absolutely able to talk much more freely to the people who go to that website. And if you're really wondering, uh, like I saw one comment when I uh, scrolling up here, it's like, holy shit, Dolan's alive. Yes, I'm alive. I'm doing just fine. And I'm very active on my website at Richard Ola Members where I have a lot more freedom to talk about the things that are important to me. So if you want to follow what I'm doing, that's really the place to go. And, you know, I'm sorry to disappoint you if you want to get everything on YouTube all the time, but I don't foresee YouTube as a long-term solution uh, to my desires for getting information out. And I think a lot of other people are feeling the same way. So I think YouTube's really uh, shooting themselves in the foot. But honestly, I think what YouTube really is trying to do is just to become a, a major corporate platform. Uh, I really, you know, I think it's very obvious, like independent con uh, content creators like myself and like many others are really getting pushed to the side and I th I, the writing's on the wall. So this is what's happening. More and more, you're going to see it. Um, I like YouTube. I listen to music on YouTube. I listen to other uh, various things on YouTube that I enjoy and I am still going to be on YouTube, but again, as a long-term solution, I'm I'm just not feeling the love from YouTube. And I think a lot of other people are feeling the same way. So uh, let me move to the next slide here. Oh, yes. So and then I'm going to get into my next, I'm gonna, I want to talk about the whole fourth stage of humanity idea that I have here. COVID is definitely moving us toward the whole microchip society. Uh, this is an article dealing with a uh, DARPA funded implantable biochip that uh, we're told is uh, here to detect uh, or is designed to detect COVID-19 and could hit the markets by 2021. What the hell is this saying? Well, let's go take a look. This is very interesting. And again, I would encourage you to go uh, look into this. Is, I read this off of, I think, Zero Hedge, which I'm a pretty big fan of Zero Hedge. They have a lot of good news articles there. Uh, so about 10 years ago, there was a scientist who made a, a very significant breakthrough. And essentially it was a way to reprogram uh, your RNA, your part of your DNA, to uh, deal with a whole array of illnesses. And basically what it seems to me, and I'm not an expert here, but it really looks like we're talking about bioengineering human beings to make them healthier and you know, hopefully to get a lot of good results out of it. Obviously it's, um, you know, when you talk about genetically modifying human beings, designer babies and, you know, everything else related to uh, epigenetics and changing our, our gene structure, 
and gene expression, there can be a number of very positive things that come out of it to make you healthier, to make you live longer, to shut off the aging if they can figure that out one day, uh, to reverse your aging process. Like all of these things actually are in the works and on a personal level, it would be hard not to get excited if you had the opportunity to you know, go back to your 25 year old body again, like who wouldn't want that? But there's other elements of this. So this guy's invention um, is now, there's a company called Profusa, which has gotten uh, rights to use elements of this and they are now in the COVID mix. And what they're doing is uh, they've got this implantable uh, chip that they are working on and again, this is something that I would encourage you to go research on your own, um, where they are talking about the ability to insert their chips into human hosts uh, as a way of helping uh, to detect when you get COVID-19. In other words, uh, you know, they've got little sensors in there. And when you get the illness, um, that triggers certain immuno responses in your body that this chip will detect and boom, the little light goes on. And this is all done with 5G technology, by the way. So it's all wireless uh, transmission and probably on your cell phone app, you get a little red alert, ding, 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 you now have COVID-19. And so that's, it. you know, it's not hard to see that this is uh, in terms of dealing with a pandemic and getting immediate results to uh, that you can work with to kind of isolate infected people. Yeah, that's that works really well. That could be highly effective. The downside of that is simply that this technology, like we were just reading, this technology can absolutely be used to change the expression of, of your genetics itself. And this literally could be used, at least in theory, to screw with your own DNA. Now, my guess is right now there may be, uh, that might be considered illegal to do that, which would be very nice. But the very fact that we're seeing this whole thing being rolled out now is really, really quite remarkable. So I don't have any more slides here I want to show you. There's a number of other things that COVID is doing that's really moving us into this new form of civilization. I mean, one of the whole social distancing and the mask wearing in general, I think we have to say that it's it's creating a massive psychological reaction among people around the world. And, you know, when you are conditioned by fear all the time, uh, which is what has been happening throughout all of 2020, you, you really have to ask yourself, what next is coming down the road? Well, a couple of things are coming down the road. Like we're, we've got an in, insane election that's less than one month away here in the United States. And uh, so, you know, with an entire year of people just having the hell scared out of them um, and, and fear being ramped up on both sides of the political spectrum in the United States, uh, you now have a situation in the U.S. where I think a third of the country on either political spectrum believes that violence will be justified uh, in the event that their side loses the election. That was a poll that I just recently read. Um, in general, I think we, what we can say relating to censorship, I just want to make this point before I get into, um, I want, before I shift gears here. Sometimes, you, you know, you hear people defending Facebook and Twitter censorship or YouTube censorship. And the argument that you hear is, well, they're private corporations. So it's true, like we have in the United States, there's a First Amendment, which protects your right to free speech. And that is an amendment that, that bars the United States government from censorship. And that has been a foundation, not, not simply of, of United States uh, political culture, but that's gone to, you know, that's become something that the rest of the world has has absolutely taken to heart. But what you have with Facebook and YouTube and uh, Twitter primarily is that these private social media companies, they have, of course, they've given themselves broad discretion to removing content. And the legal foundation for them to do that is the 1996 
Communications Decency Act and something known as Section 230, which gives those companies legal protection as platforms and not as publishers. And so it allows them to remove uh, objectionable material without defining it precisely. What you're seeing is a, a movement in the United States to have them classified as publishers and, um, and so that they don't have a lot of the protections that they are enjoying. But essentially what you've got is that these private corporations are being used by the, the government apparatus or the deep state primarily, and there is a deep state. I used to call it a national security state. Uh, they're the proxy for engaging in the wholesale censorship that the intelligence communities, the financial communities are constantly, you know, hankering for. And so these massive monopolistic corporations are acting as censors. And it's, you know, it's definitely something that I think we really ought to all be concerned about. So, uh, in fact, they're fulfilling the exact same role that um, was it the National Endowment for Democracy, the NED, has done ever since uh, they were founded in the 1980s. You know, in the old days, the CIA used to organize foreign coups all the time. And once they got enough bad press after Watergate, after Vietnam, after the United States Senate investigated uh, intelligence community activities worldwide and, and discovered good God, shock, shock. The CIA actually tries to kill people. They actually try to overthrow governments. How did we, how did we not know? <laughs> and so there was a blowback after that. And one of the main things that you saw in the aftermath is the creation of these uh, NGOs. And the lead one, I think, was the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy, which to this day is basically the color revolution, regime change, uh, folks that funnel money into other nations to destabilize them, to uh, then implement the regime change that they want. I think it's a really strong argument to make that that whole regime change model is really being worked on in the United States. So what the United States has created to send elsewhere is now being come brought, brought home to roost. I talked about this on my website if you're interested. I've got a whole, whole presentation on that. Um, so let me get into this this idea that I've been working for a while, something I call the fourth stage of humanity. Again, if you really want to get into the details of this, do check the link that I have below this box. Uh, it's a lecture that I gave on June 6th of this year, along with a lecture I gave on uh, alien agendas, uh, that's plural, and uh, which was the first time that I ever really got into that whole theme as well. And in fact, I'm writing a booklet, like 100 page booklet, versions of those two lectures. So I'm writing a 100-page booklet on this thing I'm talking about tonight, and that's just about done. I'll have, no, actually, no, the Alien Agendas is just about done, excuse me, and then I'll have a, a booklet on this theme that I expect to have done hopefully in a month. Uh, I want to get these things out. And then I have a really neat interview I did with Alejandro Rojas, a journalist on the future of ufology. You can check that out. That's all in the link that's below here. So <clears throat> what the heck is the fourth stage of humanity? Well, one thing that I like to do in my life, uh, in addition to studying the UFO phenomenon and in addition to studying contemporary geopolitics, is I like to look at the long view of human history. And this is something I've done my whole life. Um, it's a funny thing. When I was growing up back in the 70s, um, learning about the history of the human species, you know, you would read about Cro-Magnon Man or Cro-Magnon Man, which when I was a kid in like 1975, uh, I read, well, scientists believe that, you know, Cro-Magnon man, who is us, you know, they're homo sapiens sapiens, exactly the same as us, uh, only existed as recently as 40,000 years ago. And the prevailing consensus back then was that that's how recent the human species was, 40,000 years. And over through the 1980s and 90s and to the 21st, 21st century, that number has been pushed back. Um, even just a few months ago, I thought it had been pushed back only to 250,000 years. Turns out that's short. So now the current number is, I believe, 315,000 years. So people like us with our exact genetic structure that could interbreed with us and so forth uh, without a problem have existed for 
more than 300,000 years. Um, and that's all, of course, out of Africa. It wouldn't surprise me and it probably wouldn't surprise you if future discoveries push that number back even further. Could they go back to half a million years? That would be kind of amazing. Maybe, maybe it will happen. But right now we're at 300 plus thousand years and that's quite amazing. And the reason it's amazing is because for nearly all of that time, for, I mean, until about 10,000 years ago, human beings lived in one and only one way, only one form of society. And that form of society was hunting and gathering. That's it. There's no evidence that we had anything other than that. Uh, maybe maybe one day we'll discover evidence or proof of a, of a lost civilization that achieved a high level of attainment you know, 100,000 years ago, but we don't have any evidence of that now. What we have right now only, uh, and I, th I think this is probably a good case to make for it, is that for 300,000 years, human beings lived as hunters and gatherers. And by the way, they lived in, a, generally speaking, a very healthy existence. I read a very, very good book uh, about a year or two ago by a uh, uh, a Yale, I think, anthropologist named James C. Scott called Against the Grain. If you're really interested in human prehistory, I strongly recommend that book. This whole argument, by the way, is, you know, this is something that only I thought an academician could make in an ivory tower. It's like, basically, this thing we call civilization was a big mistake. We should have never, never have done it. We should never have stopped being hunters and gatherers. But by the time I finished his book, I thought, guy's got a pretty good point. Uh, our brains were larger, our bodies were larger and healthier. We probably lived just about as long as we do now and probably had a much easier life and we're probably a lot smarter than we are today, actually. So anyway, I'll leave that argument aside. For 300,000 years, that's how all human beings lived as hunters and gatherers. And then about 10 to 15,000 years ago, we went through a transformation that is absolutely dramatic and radical. And that's when human beings started to plant crops and they started to raise livestock. They, they would capture those wild sheep and put them in, in a pen and raise them and domesticate them and breed them so that they became more docile. And eventually sheep lost, lost I think 30 or more percent of their brain capacity and became very, very docile and totally unlike wild sheep. But basically what I'm talking about is the agricultural revolution where human beings settled in societies and it gave those people a very slight population edge over the hunters and gatherers. And before long, a couple of thousand years, uh, sedentary agriculture spread throughout much of human society and that created civilization. Because when people started settling in one place, they had to do a number of things to be able to get along. They had to learn how to write they had to learn how to make agreements that that had to be put down in the form of writing. They invented the wheel. They invented uh, social hierarchies and political structures and, and formal religion and, and, and boats. And well, they probably had boats before that, but really developing a lot of these things in a much more sophisticated way. You know, so you go from hunting and gathering, the next thing you know, you got the Roman empire and the Chinese empire and all of that. So that's stage two of humanity agriculture uh, and civilization. And that's what we did pretty much nonstop for about 10,000 years until just a couple of hundred years ago, we hit stage three. And stage three is what you can call science and industry. Basically starting, you can push it back to 350, 400 years ago, guys like you know Rene Descartes and Galileo and Isaac Newton, creating a scientific foundation for a completely radically new way of thinking about reality, which is what they did. They created the scientific method. And right on the heels of that, you get industrialization in, in England, followed by industrialization in other parts of the world. And that's what absolutely revolutionized the world starting around you know 1750. And that's the industrial revolution. That's phase three or stage three of humanity. When you look at all of these stages, within those stages, there's all kinds of variety, but there's much more consistency than variety. Like I, I would argue you could take, you know, for like stage two, the agricultural, you could take a, a peasant out of ancient Egypt from like, you know, 5,000 years ago and, and drop that person in the middle of uh, medieval France of like, say, the year 1500. So you've got a difference of you know 4,500 years. But I would, I would argue that that peasant 
Yeah, there'd be culture shock without a doubt, but ultimately that person would be able to adjust pretty well to life in the French countryside because basically the cycle of life is still fundamentally the same even after all those thousands of years. But drop them just a couple of hundred years later into the city of London in the year 1800 and I don't think he'd be able to function pretty well. I think he would probably lose it because it's a fundamentally different society. But if you take that person in London in 1800 and drop them into New York City in the 1930s or 1950s, there would be a lot of culture shock. But again, I, I would argue they would be able to understand the fundamental structure of that world. So those are the three forms of human society fundamentally until now, until now. So now what's happening is that we are looking at the confluence and the the amalgamation, the synergy, the you could say the evil synergy or the good synergy of a variety of technologies that are coming together all at once right now. Uh, strong artificial intelligence, uh, 5G uh, communication technology, smart technology, uh, nanotech, uh, bioengineering, um, you know, all of those for starters. And, uh, you know, quant, um, well, I was going to say quantum computers, but also uh, molecular computers. This is a new thing that I'm learning about. Uh, these new and radical kinds of technologies. And then, you know, they are going to synergistically create all kinds of new uh, developments that would basically take all of your privacy away for the rest of all time. You know, so if you've got smart devices in your home that are connected by a 5G network that is itself connected to an AI algorithm in some central office that can monitor and basically do a minority report style predictive behavioral programming of you uh, and be right and to know your personality in many key ways better than you know your personality, okay? They can predict where you're going to go because they GPS you 24-7. And with the with the computing power that we've now developed, like there's there's no getting out of it. Voice recognition technology, facial recognition technology. So to people around the world, uh, you know, it is it is possible to track someone 24 seven throughout their entire life now. And then of course, that's not even getting into social media um, and everything related to that. So what we're dealing now with uh, is a world, oh, and I didn't even get into the economics. And in fact, good grief, I didn't even talk about the economics of the COVID lockdown. We're going to talk about that before I'm done. Um, the economics of AI algorithms and their ability to take your job away from you. And if it hasn't been taken away from you now, just wait, because it's happening to everybody uh, or, or most everybody. And yes, you know, you can accuse me of being like a, what's known as a Malthusian and being a doom and gloom type of person saying, well, there's no hope here. Um, and, and forgetting that new opportunities may develop, which, okay, fine. Let's take that. Maybe there will be some new opportunities, but are there going to be enough opportunities for 8 billion people living on this planet? I think, you know, the answer as well as I do. The answer to that is no. And this is why all the AI experts are talking about the necessity to roll out universal basic income and all of that stuff, because they know there's just not going to be a job for people. Um, so what we're talking about here is all of these things. We're creating a society of total surveillance, total propaganda, and centralized control through social media and through uh, legacy media. So to control the information that's coming to you more and more effectively every year, every month, every week, um, and with you with nothing to do, you with no job. So good luck trying to create meaning in your life without the ability to support yourself or your family. That's hard to do. Um, that's a psychological blow that a lot of people are not going to be easy to deal with. So what's the answer to that? Well, I can, I can predict just as well as anyone else. The answer is going to be uh, totally immersive virtual reality that uh, people are going to live out their lives in fantasy land. And that's the world because there's, you know, ready player one type stuff where there's no other alternative. You know, the real world is going to suck. And so just, just trip out into fantasy world and, 
and you can do whatever you want there. And that's really what we're looking at. And, and we can see this whole thing happening already. And it's creating all kinds of psychological changes. It's creating physiological changes in people. Um, and we can see it all happening. Uh, one of the things that the coming transhumanist age is going to be allowing, of course, are designer babies. Um, that is, I assume you'll have an opportunity to purchase better gene expression for your children or for yourself, maybe. Maybe, maybe that will be the case. I don't know what that's going to cost. I somehow doubt that it's going to be fully available, uh, you know, freely for everyone in the world on an equal basis. I mean, I, what, what do you think the odds are for that? So what I think we're looking at is a world where uh, some people will be able to buy better genes than others. And I think we are definitely going to be looking at um, something that for many, many years I have predicted as a biologically based caste system in the world. Now, I'm not saying that's a slam dunk and definitely going to happen, but I think you've got to, you have got to prepare for that possibility because that is absolutely on the table. And what we need to be asking is how do we stop that from happening? How do we prevent a biological caste system from developing in which there will be future humans that will that could literally be like the gods of the new society, you know, live longer, smarter, stronger, healthier, all of that stuff. And, and much more intelligent, much more intelligent. So I think this is, in, you know, like Brave New World. You know, Huxley, back in the early 1930s, kind of nailed it in a lot of ways. Um, this He really created the model in fiction of a biological-based caste system. If you have not read Brave New World, I strongly recommend that you read it, along, of course, with Orwell's 1984. But start with Brave New World. The crazy thing about that book, by the way, is he wrote it in the early 1930s. So what is that? That's 90, almost 90 years ago. And it it is remarkably, remarkably prescient already. So go check it out. Um, let me talk a little bit about the econo economics of all of this, um, how COVID is. So you can just see like the news articles that I was quoting you earlier, I think uh, are definitely moving us into this type of society. What is that type of society? It's one big ant colony is that type of society where you've got total surveillance, total control, total conformity, uh, a society where, God forbid, you stick your neck out and stick your head out uh, and express an opinion that is counter to the prevailing authoritative sources that you're supposed to believe. Or it's like, you know, you know, these for the next generation, I can predict that. Uh, you know, the centralized elite will be playing whack-a-mole with all of all of the independent thinkers that are out there. And eventually, I think they won't have to play so much whack-a-mole because the future generations are going to grow up with a very docile view of all of this anyway. Uh, that's my prediction. You know, when you raise a kid to rely on Alexa or Google Echo for to answer all of their needs, um, then you are you are literally raising the next generation of people without having the ability to do any research on their own. Because the whole point of, of Alexa and Echo, and I remember um, uh, hearing this directly from an interview with Eric Schmidt of Google. He said, look, when we have people asking Google questions, we want, they are to have one authoritative answer and only one answer. We don't want to make it complicated. So that should tell you something. Because think about how complicated reality is. <laughs> reality isn't simple. Reality is complex. Most of the interesting questions that we ask of the world are complex and require nuance in their answers. But that's not what they're doing anymore. So basically, you know, you have an eight-year-old kid asking Alexa, um, you know, about uh, the French Revolution or the civil rights movement or some other historical thing, and they get simple boiled down answers, boom, and the kid will take that to their, you know, social studies teacher and get a blue check mark on their paper. So that's the world we're moving into. Simple, 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 uh, dumbed down. Uh, 
to an extreme that even, you know, I've been talking about this for more than a decade. I mean, I've been, I will say, I, I could probably go back to some of my old lectures and, and see these themes being developed in the early 2000s. Uh, and I think there's a lot of other people who saw this coming global totalitarianism occurring. But I will confess to you that the, the swiftness of how this has happened in the last five years has really shocked me. Like I was not anticipating this. I mean, not this fast, not this rapid. Um, I was, uh, I see a comment, ask Alexa how to end the deep state. Good one, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm sorry, that does not compute. <laughs> There was, there was that old uh, Star Trek original series episode where Kirk uh, has to, there's a couple of them where he has to outwit these uh, intelligent super AI computers with his, with his creative logic. You know, if only, if only it were that easy to do that, right? Sadly, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, let me talk about the economics of what we're dealing with right now. And um, again, I'm not here to try to scare the hell out of you, but we've got to be realistic here. We have to look at the reality that is staring us in the face. So what, what's happened with, you know, from the start of these lockdowns is we've uh, committed West, you know, global civilizational suicide. In the name of saving people, we've, we've shut down the global economy. We have, we're not out of the woods with supply chain, chain problems. That's only just starting, all right? We have completely trashed so much of the global economy um, and the only thing, there's one thing that's kept it floating because we've shut everyone down. So it's the trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of liquidity that has been injected into the economy through stimulus packages, not just in the US, by the way, but in other, other nations as well. So you've got uh, government spending where they're not even spending, they're conjuring the money digitally out of thin air and throwing it into the economy. And, and it is only that you know, in lieu of having a functioning economy, of course, that's the only thing keeping everything afloat. People have to have it, understandable. Um, the only reason governments are able to do that is because, you know, when governments go take on debt, they issue government bonds. And uh, not everyone's really expert on this. I'm not even an expert on it. I'm not an economist. I try to understand these matters to the best that I can. But what happens is governments issue bonds that have to be purchased. Now in olden times, citizens would buy those bonds. And so the citizens had an investment in the government and, and the government could spend the money, citizens would buy bonds and uh, those bonds would be repaid by the way. Uh, citizens aren't buying these bonds that are worth trillions of dollars, hell no. They're only being bought by one and one source only. That's the central banks in the world. They're buying government debt. Now, there's a real good question to ask yourself here. I wish I had the answer to this. And I wish I had a timeline about this. But there can easily come a day when central banks decide they're not going to buy the, any more debt. Um, maybe they'll just keep doing it forever and ever and ever. Uh, but maybe they won't. And if that ever, if there's, we're at the mercy, you and me and everyone in this world, of central banks buying sovereign debt of the nations around the world, from the United States right on through all the others. If that were ever to stop, it's like this, this endless cycle, you know, and if the, if the wheel stops, it's impossible for me to envision just how bad things can go. You have an economy that's just hanging on, hanging on, hanging on, and suddenly, and everything falls. And like, you don't want that to happen, and I don't want that to happen. And, but if it were to happen, that's, that is the great reset. We're in the middle of the reset right now. Like, 9-11 was the first great reset. 9-11 was the moment which you learned from your government that those things that you had that were called rights that you thought you had, well, you don't have those, so just give that up. And then after 9-11, after the passage of the USA Patriot Act and all the other nasty, pernicious, shitty laws that were passed in the aftermath of that to further strip you of your rights, you know, we thought we were in a new normal then. And, you know, we were for a little while. Then came the global financial crash of 08, and that was, that was a bit of a reset. That just siphoned more money up to the top. 
Um, it didn't really involve, as far as I can think of, a lot of legal transformations. And now, but now we're in the new reset, the COVID reset. 20 years after 9-11, we're in this 19 years later. And this is a continuation and a deepening, a severe, significant deepening of that reset to create a new world. But we're not done with the reset. And the reset will only be done, it seems to me, <laughs> if there is an economic reset. And, and um, I personally shudder at the thought of what that could be like, like what that reset could actually be. Um, how bad will things go? Because you'll have, well, I think one thing you could easily predict, it's not hard to see, martial law globally. Because when times are that difficult, that bad, and people are that desperate, uh, they're going to do anything to be able to eat and not get evicted and all of that stuff. So I think you could probably see a, a real likelihood of martial law everywhere, any direction you look. And then as a result of that, an eventual resetting and I would assume siphoning of yet more money out of the public's hands upward. And once that's all done, and once the new total control system is in place, something that is even vastly beyond anything that we're looking at now, okay, here in October of 2020, um, then we will see an easing of the crisis into the true plan of the reset, which will involve, mark my words here, like overt total surveillance, total overt heavy-handed propagandistic information and control, uh, total you know social engineering and every everything else that you can imagine, and and and. Um, some form of uh, universal basic income, I could see that. Um, <clears throat> the only thing that's, that prevents me from seeing how that can work is, you know, we will have crippled so much more of the global economy, how that money is going to be generated to support people. I, I, I don't even know. I wish I knew because I can't figure out a way in which it makes sense to me. Um, I'm not an economist and there may be some of you out there <clears throat> for whom it can make sense. You know, just can you just print fiat currency uh, indefinitely forever? I mean, that seems to be that seems to be the plan, right? Just just print, 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 print. Um, at some point, you know, whenever I'm I read a, a financial expert or an economist, they all say the same thing. It's like you can't do this forever, but yet governments and banks are acting as though they can do this forever. So anyway, um, the COVID lockdown has precipitated this global economic meltdown, which has precipitated the additional trillions and trillions and trillions of debt. And it uh, seems to me uh, has to be taking us much closer to the precipice than we ever were before. So yeah, the COVID pandemic lockdown, it's not the, it's not the disease really that's doing it. It's the reaction to the disease that's, that's moving us ever further to this fourth stage of humanity. And you make no mistake, we are moving to that stage. And, and even without the draconian response to the pandemic, we still would be moving to that stage. And we'd still be moving to it pretty fast. But this is a, you might call it a major punctuation along the way. It's like a major point, a moment at which at which the gains are consolidated, right? And the legal structure for the new system is rolled out, is tested and then rolled out and put into place. So does anyone honestly think that, you know, the surveillance drones that are now being used to track you, at least in Victoria and Australia, so you don't go more than five kilometers from your house. Uh, does anyone think that that's going to go away in the future after this whole crisis is over? Or do you think more likely that those are gonna be replicated and put 
everywhere. Everywhere. You know, as I said when I started this talk with you, uh, the virus started in China, and we know that. And the response to this virus is turning the entire world into China. And that's happening. So I don't like this any more than you do. Um, how, how we can deal with this, how we can stop this is a really good question. I don't, I don't know like what's the best way that people can stop this. Uh, what we have to do, the first step in dealing with any problem of aware of it first. You can't fix the problem if you don't know that it exists. Now, the problem that we're dealing with today is like most people that we talk to, most of our neighbors, they're like, yeah, this whole thing sucks. Boy, I just want to get back to the way things were. Like, and that's where the headspace most people are in. And what most people need to understand is that's not going to happen. We're not going back to that. Whatever we go back to is not the old normal. By the way, a phrase that I hate, detest, is the phrase, the new normal. I detest that phrase. Um, what we're seeing isn't a new normal. We're seeing, I think one person put this very well, we're just seeing the destruction of the old normal. That's all we're seeing. And we're seeing chaos as a result. Um, although I think in reality, we are going to see a new normalization, a new, but maybe we shouldn't call it normal because it's really abnormal. It's, it's unnatural. This fourth stage of humanity is the thing about it is that it's anti-human. It's it's not it's actually not human. Like you're a human being and you are designed to live with other human beings, to make eye contact with them, to to touch them and shake their hand and to deal with them and to deal with crowds and to uh, and it's also like your birthright to be confident in yourself and in your world. All of that confidence is being stripped out and it's being replaced with fear. And, you know, your ability to think for yourself as an individual, um, that's part of your birthright also. And that in this next stage of our civilization and our species, that's being stripped out. You're going to be guided and your children and your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren and their great-grandchildren very likely are going to be guided by an AI intelligence that is managing a society that no human being could even understand. That we're, we're going to lose the ability to understand how to manage our society. You know how it was like 150 years ago before there was electricity everywhere, uh, you know, people didn't need electricity to live. Like they figured they lived in a non-electrified world. <clears throat> and then once we developed electricity, we were like, oh crap, we can't live without this. We have all of our lights and our power tools and all of our, our refrigerators and everything else. And they all rely on electricity and we became very dependent on it. And we're now at a point where we are already dependent on, of course, the web for our very survival. Uh, and we are dependent upon increasingly artificially intelligent algorithms to manage a lot of that traffic and to manage our power grids and to manage God know, knows what else. And that's only going to deepen. And not only that, but increasingly, we don't even understand how they make those decisions. Like we're out of the loop. All right. And that's only going to increase. So that's the world we're moving into where we are genuinely turning ourselves into slaves of technology. We are becoming slaves to the machine. And how the hell to get out of that? How the hell to escape that madness? And it is madness. Well, if I had that answer, I would surely tell you what that answer is. And I, you know, people would be like, yes, wonderful. Um, you know, the answer starts with knowledge. And from knowledge, well, organization. And let's call it intelligent resistance. 
not hashtag resistance. I'm just saying smart resistance to the trends that we're seeing. How to do that? Well, we're going to just have to figure this out as we go because I don't have that answer. I'm seeing the problem. You're seeing the problem. And getting through this into an era of actual answers is is not going to be easy. And I'm, I'm sorry to have to leave it on a downer of a note like that, but um, that's the way it is. Now, there's there's one, one more thing I want to talk about here, uh, and that's this whole vaccination thing. So I think we're at a point now where we can recognize. All right. Like on a personal note, I have not taken a vaccination for anything uh, probably in 20 years or more maybe 30 or 40 years. It's like, it's been that long. Like I, I literally, I'm not able to remember the last time I took a vaccination shot. Um, I've never in my life had a flu vaccination shot. And I, I can't remember. I mean, when I was a kid, I got vaccinated, um, for things. Um, but now we're talking about vaccination for COVID and look, the, everyone here knows, you know, this as well as I do, the writing is on the wall, right? In the sense that, you and I and all of us are not going to be allowed, not going to be allowed to have a functioning society anymore until there's mass vaccination for this, right? All right can we like, agree that that's good? That's happening. Now, despite the fact that probably more than half the global population is like, hell no, I'm not going to take a vaccination. And not just in the US, all right, where there's tremendous resistance to this. It's everywhere in Russia where they actually may have actually developed a vaccine for this that doesn't produce serious side effects. This is what I'm reading. Now, maybe maybe they're just BSing us, but the, as far as I can tell, everything that I'm reading is that the Russians have developed a vaccine that is that seems to work and that doesn't give you terrible side effects, unlike the ones that we're developing in the West right now, Moderna and, and the other one, um, the, you know, the one that Bill Gates is pushing nonstop. By the way, Bill Gates is, I think, the leading funder for the World Health Organization, the Bill Gates Foundation, just in case you wondered, WHO, that's Gates. Um, but anyway, back to the vaccines. Um, like, we're not going to be allowed, all right, to have a functioning society. All right, can we all see that? Yes, I think we can. So you've got uh, President Trump saying, we're going to have that vaccine ready by the election. Well, uh, you know, who believes that? I don't believe that. No one believes that. It's it's not possible, uh, even by the end of the year. Uh, you know, it takes decades sometimes to develop a genuine vaccine for most of these diseases. And so to think, or for a virus, to think that you're going to have this done for COVID, like now, come on. Let's say... Best case scenario. Best case scenario would be that the Russians, because they seem to be out ahead on this, they roll theirs out at the beginning of 2021, which is what they're saying. You know, they're running their trials. They've got the sample population that they're working on. It's right now. So let's just say that they succeed, right? And in January of 2021, the Russians start implementing a nationwide uh, vaccination, which by the way, in Russia, the resistance to this is every bit as strong as in Western countries. Russians are just like 50% of the population is like, hell no, we don't want this. But let's say they force it on the population there. So do you honestly think that you're going to see that, that Russian vaccine brought to the West? Hell no, absolutely no way. Not a chance. The, the Western nations I mean, they hate Russia. Russia is the arch enemy. You can never get Russia, Russia credit for anything, even if they uh, cured COVID with a vaccine. So we're going to wait for the Western um, vaccination. And there's no way that that's going to happen before the spring of 2021. And that's optimistic. You know, to have a role, we're probably looking, probably looking at the summer of 2021 at the earliest. And if that is the case, you think about what that means economically, right? I don't even need to tell you what that means economically. That's absolute utter destruction of the last vestiges of what we currently have. And 
and uh, you know where we're going to go from there. So, but if there's a glimmer, is there a glimmer of a hope, of a possibility, of a shadow of a chance, a hail mary as the buzzer goes off, you know, um, that we get the vaccinations rolled out just in time to prevent total economic collapse? Because like that, my friends, is the only gamble that they've got up their sleeve right now. And it's really ridiculous when you think of the last presidential debate, like none of this stuff was really discussed. Like no issue of genuine importance was discussed by either candidate. Um, this was not discussed. The economics of the lockdown have not been discussed. Um, not, not with any kind of, you know, honesty. And don't expect it moving forward. You know, we live in a, we live in an artificially enforced uh, fiction. That's that's what we live in, an, an, uh, an enforced artificial fiction of a reality where you are forced to take in an absolute fiction of how, how this world is working. Um, it's worse than censorship. It's like being forced to <laughs> believe in false narratives and lies. So, so that's really where we're at. And I'm just going to tell you, uh, if you live in a city, you should consider, I'm considering moving out of the city that I live in. I don't want to live in a city anymore. I'm done. Um, and a lot of people are doing the same. And, and the other thing is, you know, do what you can to look after those you love. I'm not saying panic. Don't panic. Be calm, but plan plan for tough times ahead because that's what we're looking at. Now, I'm going to wrap this up in a minute. Um, in the future, I'm going to come back to this theme and I'm going to have a, a UFO spin to it because I have one. I will be talking about this. But right now, this is what it is. Um, we're dealing with a a lurching forward into a new form of existence that is totally unlike any form of existence that human beings have ever had in the past. And we're doing it like that. We're doing it as fast as possible and with a level of control that, you know, might have been matched by say, you know, a medieval village when the church controlled every single thing that you thought, or, you know, maybe Sharia law or something like that. Uh, that's a strong level of control. Yeah, absolutely. But this, what we're moving into is a similar level of control, but a secular form of that. And actually a more invasive form of control, even than the ones that I mentioned, because these are forms of control that get you completely inside your home as well as outside your home. And there's just no escape. And, and that is, <clears throat> that is anti-human, I will say, as inhuman and it is anti-human and um I, I mean i can just tell you from myself i want no part of that and i'm going to do everything i can to maintain whatever level of freedom and um and free thought that i can have in my life and i hope you do the same all right i think that's enough i was trying to do this for one hour and i clearly went over so I would like to thank every one of you for showing up here. To me, this is an important subject and um, I'm glad you showed up for it. I also want to thank a few other people. I want to thank the uh, folks who run my social media that's Pursuing X. I want to thank my wife, Tracy, who I know is in the chat room there for being here. Um, I want to thank the uh, member hosts of Richard Allen Members and uh, the moderators who are there. They are always here in force to help uh, smooth out, you know, the chat situation. And I just want all of you guys to know that I'm very grateful for all of the amazing work that you do. Um, I could not do any of the things that I do without the support of not just, uh, those of you who come to attend these talks of mine, but for those volunteers who help me out every single day. And I am incredibly grateful to them. Um, if you like what you see on this YouTube channel, please subscribe and make sure you get notifications. That really helps me a lot. And if you like this show, smash that like button. 
all you guys in the chat family, smash it. Um, that helps me as well. And if you're really interested in what I'm up to these days, you really need to check out my website. That is richarddolanmembers.com because that is where I'm always most active. Um, a lot of the themes that I've been discussing here, I've been talking about for quite a while on that site. So do check it out. And again, I want to remind you, if you are interested in this theme of the fourth stage of humanity and you want to know, like, what the hell is Dolan talking about? Is this crazy talk or not? I do have a lecture that is available. It is linked below this, this uh, video box. Go check it out and you can see the page. And you can also see the links for the other two uh, lectures and presentations, which is one is on alien agendas. That's a first that time that I've ever done such a thing. Um, and a great interview that I did with Alejandro Rojas where we talk about the future of ufology. Do check those out as well. They are linked below. Okay, so that's that's it. Uh, again, thank you everyone for being here. And please, I know this was a depressing AF subject to be talking about, but we got to keep our chins up. And we have to, you know, what we don't want to do in a crisis is we don't want to be the person that makes it worse. We want to be the person that makes it better. And that, that means to, to lead as much as we can, to be calm as much as we can, to help others understand things in a calm, non-argumentative manner as much as we can. We want to make it better, not worse. You know, the one bit of solace that I, I will give myself in times like these is that human beings have lived through crises before and they've lived through tragedy and they've lived through massive death and ruination and destruction countless times and they got through it because people are strong and you i firmly believe you and everyone listening we're all stronger than we realize than we think and sometimes we just got to reach down and we got to find that strength and find that courage and pull it out and deal with it. And I believe that we can do it and we can make it better, not worse. At least that is my sincere hope. All right. Again, thanks everyone for being here. I'm wrapping it up here. Let's just remember while we learn and grow and search for the truth, let's be good to each other later. And oh, two days from now, James Fox interview, check it on this channel. Bye for now.